votes will be taken via roll call. Um, in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, signed by the Governor on February 15th, 2022, I announce that this meeting of the Select Board is being recorded by Hadley Media, the Select Board's office via Zoom, and I'm asking if there's anyone present who is also recording this meeting. If no one is recording the meeting, uh, Jennifer, let the minutes reflect that no one else has indicated that they are recording this meeting. So uh, first on the agenda this evening, we're going to start with public comment. Um, is there anyone here this evening who wishes to take advantage of the public comment period? Yes, I would like to. Okay, if you could come up, um, introduce yourself. Do I sit here? Yep, yep, and then just try to speak uh, directly into the microphone. Um, hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Kiko Mallon. I live at 19 North Maple Street in Hadley. And I'm here to uh, make comment about the item on the agenda related to the Hampshire Public Health Services Collaborative Agreement. Um, I am a Hadley resident. I'm a public health professional, have been for 30, 40 years. And I formerly worked in Northampton as uh, the director of the PHE, the Public Health Excellence Grant there. This is the grant that funds the Hampshire Public Health Shared Services Collaborative. So I'm very familiar with the work and I'm now with the town of Amherst. I'm the public health director. We're part of the collaborative and the town of Amherst just signed the IMA that is now before you to look at. Um, so I just wanted to express my both my strong personal and professional support for the work, for the public health excellence work for the shared services collaborative. It's very much the future of public health in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's about fostering collaboration and um, sharing resources, um, especially for small towns in this area that don't have a lot of staff in their public health department to address things like COVID, which nobody expected, and really kind of uh, underscored the need for all of us to work together to address you know, big threats to public health, something like a pandemic, which we did experience. And I think out of that experience has grown the focus in this work. And I, I do actually collaborate with Hadley. I spoke to Ben on the phone just recently about an issue that came to our attention. And this kind of grant does foster that sort of infrastructure building that's really important to, to really um, just maintain community health and well-being in this area. So that's that's what I wanted to say. Okay, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we are going to take it first on the agenda. So if you um, would like to stay, you're more than welcome to. I will. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like Bill Dwyer has his hand up for public comment, Bill. Yes. Uh, I wanted to update you on the planning board search for a replacement for Mike Sarzinski, who resigned in... Uh, July. Uh, I did send uh, you the official notice of vacancy. Uh, I think I copied everyone on it. Uh, I also included our timetable. We're accepting expressions of interest to fill the vacancy until the 2025 annual town election, at which point uh, the balance of the two years of Mike Sarzinski's term will be on the ballot for um, a permanent election. There'll also be another member of the board on for a five-year term. So there'll be two uh, planning board slots on the annual town meeting, uh, annual town election. Uh, we're accepting expressions of interest through uh, close of business on Friday, August 30th. We have two so far. We'll uh, I believe you also have access to those two. Jennifer can provide uh, those. Um, we're certainly interested in anyone else expressing interest. Uh, our plan is to review the applications, perhaps conduct interviews, and vote our recommendation at our meeting on Tuesday, September 3rd. And I would ask for a... Um, uh, ask that you schedule a joint meeting with the planning board at your meeting on Wednesday, uh, September 4th, to vote on uh, the, we'll make our recommendation and uh, you can make yours if we agree, we'll vote uh, to uh, appoint someone to the balance of uh, this year's term. Okay, yeah. thanks for the information. Okay, if I there are- I uh, public comment. 
<laughs> well, a, you can't okay. answer questions. It, it's a clarifying, it's a clarifying question. You, you so, can't answer questions, but I can answer questions if you want to give post. The question is, if we vote on it at the town election on November 6th, I believe it is, might be the 5th. When does that person then start sitting on the board? Oh, uh, the the seat is not up until the annual town election in May. Oh, in May. OK, thank you. So, so we would uh, we would assume that if um, we vote and you vote uh, by Wednesday, that the person could be sworn in as early as Thursday uh, and could attend our next meeting, which would be the third uh, Tuesday of September as a voting member okay thank you bill okay thank you uh, anyone else for public comments <laughs> okay if not um we'll move to the consent agenda <clears throat> this evening on the consent agenda we have the minutes from july 7th 2024 uh, a one-day liquor license application from the top of the campus at mcgurk stadium for uh, their first football game, August 31st, from 1.30 in the afternoon to the end of the third quarter. And then also an intermunicipal agreement with the city of Northampton that would be a renewal for veteran services. Jennifer? Um, there is a typo, I'm sorry, it's the July 17th meeting. I've left right. everyone off. Because the fourth was, yeah. Yeah, so if you'd like to just postpone that. And I'll just kick it over to the next meeting on September 4th. Okay, so we'll, we'll pull that um, meeting, those meeting minutes off and then with a corrected date at the next meeting. Yes, and the fire chief has asked for a fire watch to be um, on the one day liquor license from McGurk Stadium at the cost to the university. I was gonna ask about that. Um. Yeah, just subject to uh, their negotiations going on right now between the town of Hadley. So um, I guess I would prefer to amend that to say uh, subject to, well, this is August 31st, right? Not actually meeting as well. Okay. So subject to um, provisions prescribed by the fire chief, subject to change. Okay. Okay. No, I don't want to, I hate to mandate something that may turn out not to be necessary. Okay. Okay. So, but I think that'll cover Mike. So if he wants yes, something there. Yes. He, he did want the fire watching place and he did put that condition up on there. So okay. I will make sure to note that on the license and to him. Okay. Motion to approve the amended consent agenda. Second. Okay. Motion made by Randy, seconded by Jane. Any further discussion? If not, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call, roll call vote. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. And Phil? Yes. Thank you. Um, for new business, we're actually going to take item 5.2 first. Um, this is the Hampshire Public Health Services Collaborative Agreement. And uh, Ben Lucamar, <coughs> health director, is with us this evening. And Ben, do you want to... Um, Introduce yourself and then also other folks who are here. Sure. So my name is Benjamin Lipham. I'm a health director for Hadley. Uh, and the people that are here right now, there's Elizabeth uh, Lydon, who is our um, legal counsel. You can see her there. And um, Michael Hugo may be here. I don't see him right now. Is Are you online right now? Yeah, I don't see him on there. Uh, but he, if he does get here, he's, he's the uh, counsel for um, the collaborative. And um, what I'm asking for the uh, board to do is to uh, sign off on the contract that we have with the Hampshire Public Health Shared Services Collaborative. We currently have a memorandum of understanding with them. We've been working with them for a while. Uh, in my opinion, they've been a great resource uh, to us whenever we need some assistance with inspections. Uh, they are. They have the health inspectors that are there to uh, help service us. Uh, additionally, our they have public health nurses that handle our infectious disease requirements, uh, and they've been a great co collaborative partner. You know, great with communication, helping us track and trend. 
and alerting us whenever there's a there's a, an issue that arises. So uh, given our history with them and the fact that this contract will not um, uh, end up uh, costing the town of Hadley uh, any money and we can withdraw at any time that we so choose for whatever reason we choose. Um, and I'll let uh, Liz handle any contract questions about that, but that's a quick uh, part of it that I think you might be interested in. Uh, for those reasons, I'd ask that you guys uh, sign off uh, on the contract uh, and there is a, uh, a motion that's a slight amendment that Liz would speak to um, on that, and I'll let her speak in that, uh, on that item. Any questions? Uh, do we want to hear from the uh, attorney, Liz, first, uh, what the amendment might be? Sure. Um, Liz Lydon. I am with Mead, Tellerman, and Costa. So I reviewed the agreement, and... Um, I had a few minor edits, nothing major, um, but it has already been signed by all of the other municipalities. And so in the interest of um, moving this forward, the only thing that I saw that should be addressed now is that it requires, and this is something that I've worked with um, the Collaboratives Council on updating the template, but that was after this one was already signed. Um, so currently, the draft requires that all of the towns uh, provide insurance, naming all of the other towns in the collaborative as additionally insured, which would cost the town money if they were to do that. And my recommendation um, for a future update is to take that language out and say that the collaborative shall have insurance, naming all of the towns as additionally insured, and that would be paid for by the grant. And so we checked with the collaborative and they were okay with the motion um, that I'm presenting to you, which is to approve the IMA for shared health services, provided that the town not be required to obtain insurance, naming all of the participating municipalities as additionally insured. Okay. Um, and again, um, I, and I think Ben, you can answer this, the, the reason that this collaborative exists was it a direct result of the kind of the awareness that was raised during COVID, the short uh, shortness or, or um, lack of personnel available to fill health director slots, especially in small communities, or is this collaborative existed for a longer period of time? Um, I know that uh, that small towns have had an issue with uh, having the resources needed to meet the requirements of the codes that we are asked to enforce. Uh, that's been the case for a very long time. Uh, COVID brought up uh, that made it COVID made it very visible uh, that we didn't have the resources, and so that uh, put additional uh, um, vision, I guess you could say, uh, uh, from the state on this issue. And the collaborative um, uh, is, has been a great response, in my opinion, to it, uh, allowing the towns to still have their autonomy while at the same time providing them with the resources they need to uh, meet the regulatory requirements they're asked to meet, mm -hmm. uh, but has not had the resources to do so at the, at up to or prior to the collaborative existing. Okay. Um, any, any questions or comments on this topic? Should we hear from collaborative council to make sure that they're okay with this amended motion? Oh, uh, that, that's... That would be Mr. Michael Hugo, but I don't see him. Okay. Okay. I think we're relying on Liz's word on that one. That they're okay with it. Okay. He did call right. me before the meeting. Um, I'm not. He was supposed to be here, but he did call me before the meeting, and we talked about this. And he was. He indicated that he was fine with it. Okay. Thank you. Motion to accept to approve. Uh, there's a, there a specific actual, motion. Yep. There's a specific motion in board docs, um, which right. is basically what Liz said previously all right i will read that then when i get to it no i don't well, i'll do it jane all right motion i'll make a motion to approve the ima for shared health services provided that the town shall not be required to obtain insurance naming all of the participating towns as additionally insured second okay motion made by randy seconded by jane uh, if no further discussion, uh, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. 
I'm going to call the Iser. Yes. Keegan. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. And Phil. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your work on this. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thank okay. So now back to new business item 5.1. Um, so this evening, we have representatives from the library um, and as well as an outside consultant to talk about a recent evaluation that was done for the library roof. Um, do the three of you want to come to the table or do you have a particular or, or Patrick, are you speaking or? Whoever you want to see. Yeah, I mean, I think just to introduce uh, what's happening to yeah. us and the public. Which are outside consultants. Okay, so if you could introduce yourselves, your role, and then anyone else who's here to represent the library. Good evening. Um, I am Lynn Latham. I am chair of the library trustees. I will just add that I was also a member of the library building committee. With us are two other trustees, Jack Sikowski and Joanne Gnixter. And I'm Patrick Barreza, the director of the library. Um, can I ask, there are three trustees here this evening. Are you posted for a meeting or if there's no deliberation? You're, yeah, just making sure. Um, and then we have other people. Yeah, so? uh, John, if you want to unmute yourself and um, just give a, a brief introduction introduction of uh, what you've been doing for us for, for Hadley. Yeah, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. So my name is John Krapeski. I'm uh, with Gale Associates. We were retained uh, by the library to do a visual evaluation of the asphalt shingle roof problems that they had been having since construction. Um, and we developed a visual evaluation report. And uh, in that report, we list our findings. So um, Patrick, you know, I'm here to support you as you need uh, during this call. And uh, I, I guess I'll turn it over to you for now um, and, and let us know how I can help. Okay. Thanks for attending, Jen. Okay. Want to give a little bit of background and um, status report, I guess? Well, okay. Well, we, um, I think it's been noted uh, by several staff members of the of the town administration or, or you know gary berg building maintenance um tom quinlan the building inspector have noted that there were some deficiencies with the roof um those deficiencies seem to be disputed by the architect and owner's project manager they seem to to believe that the, the issues were not um particularly noteworthy so in order to try to figure out you know what to think. Uh, we first consulted with a uh, a local roofer, a couple of roofers, to get just a, a sense from someone in the in the industry. You know their their independent you know evaluation of the roof, and we kind of got some mixed stuff from those folks. We got one very detailed letter from one of the roofers, uh, but again, we we were not really clear. You know what to think. Uh, that's when we got in touch with Gail to have them come out and look at it from an engineering perspective um, to, to give us a sense of what might be going wrong if, if that were indeed the case. Um, and so we received um, in early July a very detailed report. I shared it. I, I hope that you've all seen it. Yep. Um, and John came to our trustees meeting earlier this month to go over it and to answer questions. And I'm, I'm hoping that you, you caught some of that as well. Um, so at this point, the, the status of the roof is that we have had um, two or three probable issues where water penetrated the roof and left, uh, you know, a small water stain, the largest being about the size of a dinner plate, the, the smaller ones being, you know, the size of a tennis ball. Um, but that was the extent of it. And um, we did have a roofer over to basically go up and look for the probable source of those leaks, made some repairs. We haven't had um, anything since then. Those, I think that was probably back in the winter or spring that we had um, that we had the, the main leak um, and nothing's happened since then. So we feel pretty good that, you know, for the time being, the roof is secure. 
um, and that nothing major is happening. But, you know, again, we wanted to know really if something was wrong, if there was a design issue, if there was a an installation issue. I should mention that we did um, open a warranty claim with um, GAF, the, the manufacturer of the shingles. They declined to go further with the claim. They said it was um, a matter of how the, the shingles had been utilized in this case, that they had been utilized inappropriately. So, um, and, and John can talk a little bit about that um, just from the standpoint of best practices in, in roofing and those kinds of things. I don't really want to characterize that because it's not my world, but, um, but that's really kind of, you know, why we engaged Gail to look at this and sort of tell us what they thought um, of the condition and just the, the original plan for the roof, whether it was a you know, solid design. Right, and and just to, to clarify that part too, um, and I, I was also a member of the library building yes. committee. Yep. And during during the design process, there were changes made. Yes. Right. So just yes, want to be clear that this was not the original. Right. That is an process. that's an important detail. Important it was originally process. intended to be a metal roof, and this was a value engineering decision to um, to move to asphalt when the estimation, you know, the estimators came in with estimates that were higher than expected. Uh, can you ask John when he speaks if we can clear up his in the audio? Yeah. Okay. Um, John, when you do speak, just letting you know your audio was breaking up just a little bit. So uh, can you have uh, the whole thing you want to turn those lights off so we can see it? And his audio is I, I think Lynn was saying just right. going from the gallery view to the right. But if you want his audio to be clear, yes. So uh, I'm going to chime in now. Is, is this audio any better? I switched to a, a microphone. Yes, much. It does sound better. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, I think that was the issue. I have that problem with Zoom. It seems so. Um, so. Uh, Patrick, thank you. I think uh, that was a good introduction. I'm happy to speak. You know, not, I don't want to take up the whole time here, but um, it sounds like you are asking for a quick synopsis of what we found so far and, and some of the opinions that we discussed during our, our last meeting together. Is that right, Patrick? Sounds like that's yes, that would be good. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, there's a pretty detailed 18 page report we put out together. Uh, I don't intend to flip through it during this meeting. I'm here to answer questions, but uh, in the interest of summarizing what we found, um, you have a uh, steep slope asphalt shingle roof uh, with all of your insulation outboard of the roof deck. Uh, and there are no ventilation provisions provided in the roof assembly. Uh, when I say ventilation provisions, I mean, there's no intake ventilation at the bottom downslope portion of your roof nor is there any exhaust ventilation at the top ridge of your roof. The terms I've heard used uh, in the literature I've read on this project are is hot roof, right? That's one of the terms you can use for an unventilated asphalt shingle roof. Um, one of the points we make, um, so, so the conditions we, we have obser observed and, and what Patrick had uh, initially reported to us is that the asphalt shingle roofs are showing patterns of buckling. Um, in the actual shingles themselves. Uh, all of our observations to date have been purely visual. We have not had a contractor go out, or nor have we been asked to go out with a contractor to make test cuts in the roof um, to see what's happening underneath the asphalt shingles, right? So all of our information to date is visual. It's also based off of our review of the contract documents that were provided to us from, from the library. Um, so what, one point I made is it's an unventilated roof. Um, in our climate in the Northeast here, um, it's pretty uh, industry standard or common practice in, com in the commercial construction realm when you have an asphalt shingle roof to provide ventilation below it. Uh, part of that stems from manufacturers requiring it as part of their warranty. Um, one benefit of providing ventilation below your asphalt shingles is it allows some degree of cooling to happen underneath to prevent... Um, the asphalt shingles from overheating. 
It also helps move any uh, latent humidity that might be in the system. Um, but that's just one small piece of, of the puzzle. Um, things that we haven't been able to confirm is, yes, we can look at the design documents. We can provide opinions on what, how it was designed. But we can't provide an opinion right now as how how it was constructed because we didn't do any test cuts, right? So a lot of our opinions are based off of the design review of the documents, what we saw visually. Um, and with that, we are we developed a list of opinions and potential contributors to the asphalt shingle buckling that we visually observed. So that's that's kind of a very high level synopsis and summary of our report. It goes into a lot of detail about what some other contributors to the asphalt shingling buckling could be. Um, it talks about the GAF inspection report they did, all the, albeit brief. It talks about the design documents that we reviewed uh, very briefly. Uh, and it talks about potential solutions uh, moving forward. Uh, it's, it, it's really a larger discussion that needs to, I think, happen between the library and the town uh, on, on how they want to proceed. So, Patrick, I'll turn it back over to you quickly. Um, because again, I could talk about this for hours, and I know folks don't want to be on a call for hours talking <laughs> about this. Yeah, can I just ask one really basic question? Um, and John, I'm going to ask you, I, can I assume that doing nothing is not an option? So by doing nothing, I, I take it you mean just leave the roof as it is and see, yeah. see what happens, right? Yeah. Um, we see the asphalt shingles already visually buckling. What what uh, one downside of that is that if the buck if the asphalt shingles are truly kind of buckling, flattening out, buckling and flattening out, and it kind of varies with conditions, that's putting extra movement into the asphalt shingles. So we might expect a reduced service life in the asphalt asphalt shingles where they could fail prematurely. Another condition that can happen is by buckling the shingle. You could effectively break the seal on the downslope seal of the asphalt shingle, which could allow additional moisture during the right uh, the the right conditions and the right wind driven rain events to allow water into your system. That may or may not present itself as leakage on the interior, but it could allow moisture into your system because the shingles are buckling. Right, so there could be adverse effects if you do nothing. Uh, in summary, reduce surface life of the asphalt shingles and potential for future deterioration that may lead to moisture infiltration issues into your roof assembly and possibly into the interior of the building. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure the cost and effect is, is clear to everybody. Yeah, okay. I, I have a couple of questions. So you said something about the roof ventilation. I understand what you're talking about. You said it, it should be an industry standard was it mentioned in the construction documents at all? From what we observed, um, which was, uh, it wasn't just design drawings. There was some other kind of closeout <laughs> documentation included in there, but um, our, our scope in reviewing documentation was limited. We really focused on some of the critical details of the design documents. We do see that there was a discussion of a metal panel system uh, with an alternate, I believe, of the asphalt shingle instead. I might have that flip-flopped, but either way, there's a discussion of two different roof systems. One important note is many metal panel systems, um, like a painted aluminum metal panel system or a painted galvanized steel, they don't require ventilation, right? So um, I don't recall seeing any literature specifically or any project correspondence at this time that talks about any downside of not providing ventilation in an asphalt shingle roof system does that answer okay. your question yes it does and okay. then i um patrick you said something that the shingles <clears throat> may not have been utilized properly what does that mean were they not installed correctly or were they put in a situation where they shouldn't have been well i i'm only kind of paraphrasing what was in mm -hmm. the letter from the manufacturer when they came out to inspect them they they were essentially saying and i unfortunately i don't have it here to quote from but they were essentially saying that um that it was the lack of ventilation 
that was that was voiding the warranty. Okay. In in essence. Okay. So that's what I, I understand what you're saying. It wasn't the only fault that they that they found yeah. in terms of you know. No. Yeah. But that was a, a main okay. a main point. And then my last question is, what are the shingles nailed to? Do we know that? I can speak to, to that a little bit. So again, we didn't do any test cuts at this time where you make an opening in the roof and be able to visually see all the different layers that were installed, mm -hmm. uh, nor yeah. have we seen construction photos, right? So um, based on the drawings from top down, it goes asphalt shingles, uh, a nail base installation, which is basically a OSB board, uh, some kind of wood layer. It's either OSB or plywood that's laminated to a rigid insulation. Okay. So I believe the asphalt shingles are attached to that wood layer, whether it be OSB or plywood, as part of that laminated nail-based mm -hmm. insulation material. Okay, thank you. Um, Jane and then David. Jane? Um, I have heard from our town insurance that they are concerned that because the problem has been identified, any insurance claim for leakage would not be valid or would not be met, would not be paid off. So I think that there's an urgency here to, mm -hmm. to get moving. Um, David, Phil? So, uh, Jane, how's my audio, okay? Good. All right, good. Uh, what Jane just mentioned, yes, absolutely. I mean, we have a documented uh, faulty roof. So if we do nothing at this point and we have water infiltration and mold and whatever else, the insurance company will absolutely deny that claim in the future. Um, and Gail, the, the only issue I have with your report is you mentioned a lack of construction oversight and you know you, issues with material storage and whatnot during the, the COVID time period. Um, you know, I, I was around at the time and I can tell you that we had an OPM that was supposed to be on site daily. Uh, you know, we had somebody that was working on behalf of the town to oversee this. So the idea that there was no construction oversight, I, I, I think is incorrect. Um, we had somebody there on a pretty much a daily basis uh, or they should have been based on what we were paying for for, for an OPM. Um, maybe Patrick can correct me on that, but, uh, I know for the senior center, we certainly did, uh, as well as the fire station. And, you know, what this seems to boil down to is that we chose to go with a, a three tab cheapo shingle roof that, you know, you put on a residential structure, you'd hope for 10 years max on it versus an ar architectural sh shingle that may last 30 or 40 or 50 years. And then, you know, if I recall, this was directly applied to OSB or plywood rather than even the more modern zip sheeting systems that you would see on a new construction home, never mind a, a town building. So I, I think there's a few issues there. And, you know, what it boils down to is it's going to be seven, eight hundred, a million dollars to fix this problem the correct way from what I'm seeing. So I think we need to have a serious discussion about what direction we're going to go as, as a select board and as a library trustees, whether it's a, uh, E and O claim on, you know, uh, the, the architect or the engineer or somebody, or after the installers or after the OPM, however, it's going to shake out. This is a pretty expensive mistake that was made. I would just like to make one small correction. If the report does not say that there was no oversight, but there was minimal oversight. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I don't want to you know refute and you know what you're saying. I think the important note is I think this isn't a solve all. A, a further discussion needs to happen, right? There's a lot to talk about here. Um, this was a very kind of preliminary visual only report. And um, part of the oversight, I think I mentioned it three times in the report as I quickly flipped through, it talks about minimal oversight as reported by library staff, um, the potential for a lack of adequate construction oversight, and a particular condition where um, some of the other installation, not defects, but like uh, some of the way they install the shingles might be due to uh, insufficient oversight. So again, 
uh, it wasn't intended to say there was no oversight. It was intended um, to try to make a correlation with what we heard from the library um, and so on and so forth. So it, I, I didn't want that point to come off as, as pointing fingers at all at this time. Mm -hmm. And sure. going to the point of a proper construction, that could be a very long discussion. Um, there are m many ways to construct buildings. Um, there are industry standards for that reason as well. Uh, where roofers and, and manufacturers have an opportunity to write those industry standards. Um, NRCA is an example of an industry standard organization for the roofing industry that has pages upon pages of best practices for asphalt shingle roof construction. Um, one other quick note, uh, David, um, three-tab shingle versus architectural shingles. Um, you said 10 years versus, you know, more. So, Again, it, a lot more goes into that than just the shingle itself, um, and I'd, I'd be happy to 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 weigh in on that more if if desired at any point. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, well, it seems to me that the bottom line is we need to fix the roof at some level, and we need to find who was responsible for the error, and they should be paying for it rather than the town. So I would suggest we put all the players in the same room at the same time with our legal counsel and have a conversation. So uh, just the next steps that are being proposed is that we've got a lot of information, but we need more information in order to get to that point where we can comfortably um, really assess because again, there's so many players involved. So you've got the architect, you've got the uh, yeah. contractor, yeah, that was actually doing the work. You've got the material owner, you know, the roofing material, and then you've got the OPM. Um, so I guess the way I was reading the report is that at this point, <clears throat> um, John has pointed, or you know, Gail has pointed out <clears throat> where the deficiencies lie, but how we got to that point of where the deficiency was created and who's responsible for it. We need to do more physical on-site work. And I get, so if that's the case, my question is what, what would that next step be? Is that, I mean, is that uh, a question for you or for John? Yeah. yeah so um, I think a next step, regardless of whether you go a uh, claim against any of those parties that you listed uh, or a next step in just getting a new roof installed. The idea of doing those exploratory test cuts serve both of those purposes, right? Um, if, if you're going to design a new roof for this, you want to not just rely on the documentation. You want to see how it's constructed so that, you know, if Gail was ever to ask, for example, to design a new roof, we want to know what conditions we have to work with permanently. We also want to understand what the conditions of those materials are. Can any of those materials be reused? Uh, part of that's going to also vary on the decided new roof system that might go in place, whether it's something that needs ventilation or not. And so I think the next reasonable step, um, I think having a discussion with town council may be good just to understand, you know, if that's an avenue that might, might happen, is, is if the claim is going to happen. But a next step would be to do exploratory test cuts and to further supplement the visual observations that were already made. Um, if asked to be a part of that, uh, we, you know, obviously we'd be happy to put together a proposal so you can see what that cost may be. Usually it involves, um, again, whether it's with Gail or a consultant, uh, a roofing contractor is usually retained to make and patch the cuts, whereas Gail or a different uh, consultant is there purely to direct where to make cuts and to make the observations of the cuts, but you need to get a roofer involved to actually make and patch those test cuts. Um, we, you know, if, if asked to provide a proposal, we could either have you go directly to a, a roofing contractor and retain them, or we can handle that for you and retain a contractor to do that. So just to, to help build that next step discussion on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with what he said that we do need to do the exploratory. Uh, who's who gets to make that decision? The library trustees or the board of selectmen? Well, 
Um, can, I, Nick, can I just ask you to put the um, gallery back on just so we can see our other board member in particular. There he is. Okay. Just in case he has. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, Randy just posed a question. Um, so generally in my experience and my years of on the trustees, since we are the steward of the building, we tend to make those decisions and then make a request um, or a suggestion about where we're going to fund them or how we're going to fund them. If we funded this test ourselves, um, so that's generally what would happen. I think it was important to all of us that you be in the loop. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it was really important to us that we all were in this together and that you were apprised of the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think that motivated us to come here and release updating. I appreciate and that. I should also mention that this is, you know, this is a conversation. This has been an ongoing issue for some years now. And so there have been many conversations. I've had conversations with Carolyn. We, you know, mm -hmm. we did consult with legal counsel at some point, I guess maybe two two, two years, years ago, a year ago. Was it that recently? Um, just to to sort of understand what the options were um and what the you know the the cost benefit of doing that. But it was just it was an informal. I don't know how you would characterize it, but it was really just sort of a consultation like right. how should we how should we proceed? Because again, until we had the report from Gail, we weren't really feeling very confident that we knew what was going on with the roof. Because again, we had multiple parties, all of whom individually should be able to be trusted in their professional capacity, but we were getting conflicting information. So who do we trust? Mm -hmm. Um and and how do we proceed? So you know, we've been, that's, that's how we got to this point because we really wanted to have an independent evaluation mm -hmm. um, and where we go from here. Um, and can I just ask John a clarifying question? Uh, and just to the point that David made, um, th this certainly doesn't sound inexpensive, but do we know enough now to know if we're looking at a million dollars or $200,000? I mean, is that an absolute at this point? Or no. I, I would think at a minimum, you have to strip off all the asphalt shingles. How much further do you have to go with removing original materials is unknown at this time because we don't know what the condition of those materials are. If moisture is getting into the system, you know, the type of insulation that's typically used in this application doesn't like water. It, it Once it get, gets wet, it can very drastically deteriorate and lose its thermal value. So... Mm -hmm. It's hard to answer at this point. I think it's easy enough to say that yes, you're you're in the hundreds of thousands. It's not it's not going to be a a quick fix uh, or an inexpensive fix, but the range is going to depend on the condition of the original materials that are in place. It's going to depend on what the new roof system selected is going to be. Uh, if you want with metal panel as a quick example, the cost there alone can vary depending on the material and the amount of, of other design factors you incorporate in that new metal panel roof system. So it's going to vary. I, I think, again, you're in the hundreds of thousands here. It, could it be a million? I'm, I'm not counting that out. Uh, it really depends on what's selected and the condition of the materials. Uh, Jack? John, this is a question for you. This is Jack Sankowski. I was at the meeting when you presented for the library. Could you hey, share Jack. a little of the uh, drone picture and the thermal images and what you picked up with that. Yeah, are you asking me to describe or to pull it up on a screen? Um, if you can pull it up even better, otherwise describe it. Uh, let me see if I have the ability of sharing the screen here. One second. Thank you. Let's see. Just want to make sure I can share the right screen here. Sorry, I have three screens and just want to make sure I pick the right one. Can folks see my screen? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. So this is basically the 18 page report that I have on the screen here. Um, let me make sure I have the right IR. So, uh, IR imagery or infrared imagery allows you to see thermal differences 
through opaque materials. Opaque being, you know, materials you can't see through, right? That's a quick summary of IR. Um, some of these images that we did take from our drone were IR images in that these can help you see anomalies in the roof system. Anomalies being different um, temperature readings uh, due to whether it's a leak or wet materials or uh, it also allows us to see movement of cold air, the differences of movement of cold air and warm air compared to other materials, right? So, um, you know, one thing we can see in this particular example is we can see what appears to be the joints of the four foot by eight foot um, nail based insulation panels that exist below the asphalt shingles, right? Why are we seeing these joints? Uh, part of it might be that the interior air is allowed to escape faster at those locations. Again, I don't want to go too in detail or too nerdy here, but that could be a reason why we're seeing them. Um, there are some images that we took where there was a buckle and we could see directly below that buckle from the IR imagery that it was at a joint in the, or it appears to be from a joint in the um, four foot by eight foot nail base insulation below. The other, the other thing we can use IR imagery for, this is a good example of it, you see this one dark anomaly. This tells us this particular area is a little bit colder than the rest of the roof. It could be due to water infiltration, wetting the materials below. So this might be a tool we use uh, in doing a more in-depth IR survey of the whole building to try to help us pick and choose certain areas to open up as part of an exploratory test cut phase to see if there's actually wet materials. Uh, this next image, just real quick, shows you a larger area of anomaly, right? What What's happening at this area? We can't tell right now because we haven't done test cuts, but just another good example of uh, a way you can use IR imagery to help further uh, analyze a condition like this. Um, so, Jack, does that is that what you're hoping for? Yes, thanks for showing that. Sure. Uh, but, you know... Any questions on that before I release the screen? Do the trustees have a recommendation on next steps? Did you discuss it? We have not yet had a discussion. Okay. We yes, just you saw the presentation. presentation. We have not met since then, and we wanted to share this with you to get a sort of broader sense how the town would want to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David? I just wanted to ask the trustees if there's any issues with mold or anything right now that would hamper library use by the residents, because I know you guys are busy all the time. So I just wanted to see how it, whether it's affecting your daily operations or if it's, you know, something you can live with for the meantime. There's there's currently no there's no interruption um, or inconvenience or risk to health. Um, with what's currently happening that we're aware of. Okay, thanks. Lynn, are you trying to say I'll just clarify that the water stain, which may or may not fall directly below any leak or source of water, are occur in the director's office and in the local history room. I also wanted to ask John, would you please share that last image that identifies the areas that have the greatest amount of buckling. I believe it's the last image with the red hash. Can yes, let me share my screen again. Back. Yes. Okay. And actually, can I just interject before I forget? Because it um, it is also unclear if the source of the, the leaks that we can see that left a stain um, were the result of leaks from the roof or if it was possibly from bad caulking at the clerestory window level, which was repaired this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully whatever risk there was there has been reduced or eliminated. So it's not, but it's not clear if we, the path that the water traveled, we can't say. Yeah. So on the screen right now, I believe is the image you were looking for. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this, this crosshatch that we have for this area of the roof uh, kind of signifies 
the, the areas of more widespread asphalt shingle buckling as observed visually from our staff on site, but also from our drone imagery. We did do a drone flyer over the whole roof. So we have a lot more images in our files than what is shown in this report. Just keep that in mind as well. And we're happy to share those as needed. Um, so this, this crosshatch shows the more, more regular pattern buckling that we, that we saw on the roof, but there are other areas of more scattered asphalt shingle buckling. So it is a condition that generally is happening on most areas of this roof, some areas worse than others, it appears. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, um, my own opinion is that doing nothing's not acceptable. It sounds like we need additional information. Um, I appreciate um, what I heard from our consultant is that taking the next step to do the uh, cutaways or whatever, um, to get that additional information is not a throwaway. That e that is something that would be prudent to do, even if we were just going to jump to the roof repair. So it seems to make sense that that's, that's the direction we go in. I don't know if anybody else feels I, differently. I agree with that. Um, I'd be based on the pictures I've seen, I'm disgusted with the way that those shingles were laid down. Uh, if if what's visible looks so bad, I'm very concerned about what's underneath. So right. we need to find out what's underneath. Yeah, and I think to the point that, that or the question that David just asked, you know, there is a logical evolution to anyone who's ever had to deal with water infiltration of any any kind. So nipping it in the bud now. I mean, already some time has passed. Um, David, how about your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think let's do the cutaways and uh, see what we find. But like Randy said, uh, <laughs> the workmanship on the shingles, uh, you know, that's somebody day one on in their shingle career would have probably done a better job. So I think uh, I can only imagine what's underneath there. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank and you. Um, obviously, we'll, this will be an ongoing dialogue. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John, and we'll be in touch to uh, to discuss further. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, and best of luck. We'll be talking. Yeah. Thanks, John. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Item 5.3, new business, um, employee retirement and appointments. Carolyn, you want to tee this up? Yeah. I mean, I'll start with uh, Joan Zusko, who has um, sent in, you know, notified you of her intent to retire. So that you will need to accept that as a vote. Motion to deny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. So I, 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 can, I can keep going with the wastewater. Uh, okay, situation. you want to do that, and then we'll do take a formal vote at the end? Sure. It gives people a chance to think about yeah, that. Yeah, think about that. <laughs> You're very missed. Um, so you have heard from Scott, at, at least two, I think, uh, select board meetings about the challenges he's having in wastewater. Uh, one of the options he presented to you that we uh, met and looked over numbers and got some more clarification and what that would entail, it, it would be, in our opinion, cost prohibitive to use a, a vendor to uh, basically, you know, first maybe provide some support with staffing. They're having a challenge, so they really would rather go in the direction of taking over the whole. Uh, department uh, based on uh, financially, I, I, Scott and I both agree that that, and I know Randy's been a part of some of that discussion right now is not a good time for our residents to bear that. So uh, Scott's proposal, and uh, I guess I, I do want to highlight the concern of why this is so important as I talk about this, the step that Scott took is our, our um, we, it's important that we comply with the discharge permit, and it's really important that we listen to what our staffing needs are supposed to be. And our staffing, it, 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 there is a, a need that has been expressed at the, at the state level that we need more operators there. So Scott is has um, uh, advertised for a co-chief operator uh, hoping to draw in a more experienced operator um, and uh, being able to offer a higher rate, but nowhere near what it would cost in comparison to having uh, the, the vendor coming in on it. So um, we did interview uh, 
Matthew Davies and to he comes from Amherst. He's very uh, he was very interested. We had a really good discussion with him. Um, so Scott is confident this is the best approach to move forward. So his recommendation is to um, hire Matthew. And also because of that, and this is what we'll find moving forward and that we have been finding in the municipal world, um, we're bringing in someone who's going to come, who's requesting a certain rate of pay, but that's going to impact a, a present employee that we have. So the two, uh, the, the request for Scott for his department is that we uh, bring Peter up to um, the correct grade and step to reflect a higher rate of pay um, slightly above what Matthew Davies is. So I've included those rates um, there in the, the grade and the steps. We're missing something on Peter's final amount. Here, it was somewhere the other day, I saw it, um, but it's not here. Oh yeah, it's not, you know, let's see. You don't have his final. Yeah, it's there. It's not much. Not on mine. It's less than a dollar over the other one, I think. Yeah, we just have the thirty-four oh five. And not, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to. No, it was there. Yeah. Thirty-four. Yeah. Just one second, and I'll find it. Because I remember seeing it. Yeah. It was, I don't know where it is, but it was there. Oh, I saw it. I re I remember okay. seeing it. Yeah. So. It's um, it's on the uh, agenda posted on the website for, but not board docs for some reason. It looks like. Sorry. Okay. All right. Anyway, so um, just quick question, Carolyn. Uh, does talking. the union get involved in any way on this, the DPW union or no? So that I, I think uh, Scott did discuss that. Yes. And, and Peter is here. We can I'm sure he was part of the discussion as well. Um, but it, it is in the it is on board docs, his present pay and what it would go up to. Okay. So I, I think the union was a big concern if we were going to use the private organization and trying to oh, finagle sorry. that. Yeah. I don't know that there's anything here. I'm just asking. That I've heard. Sometimes yeah. we need a sign letter or something. So, um, I mean, I don't have any issue with this, but I just want to make sure. Jennifer? It is a to pay $40.46. And it was on the agenda yep. with Jessica. Okay. Any other comments, questions about this? If not, I think we need to take two votes then. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so the first one then going back to uh, Joan Zusko's letter of intent to retire. Do I have a motion? I will sadly make a motion to mm. accept her letter of intent to retire. Okay. Is there a second on I that? I will sadly second it. Okay. All right. And a sad great motion made in second. And great thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, no further discussion on that. Jennifer, roll call vote. Roll call vote. Isaac? Yes. Evan. Yes. Evan Smith? Yes. And Bill? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then just the reason that we are sadly doing this is just a reminder to everybody that Joan is probably one of the most uh, valued and revered Municipal employees, but long time, a long, long time, and uh, she, you know, we're, she deserves we're gonna miss to retire. Her. So we will enjoy her between now and her intended date. So, okay, and then um, the second item is there a motion? I move that we accept Scott's proposals. Okay, motion made by Jane. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion made by Jane, seconded by Randy. Uh, Jennifer, roll call vote. Roll call vote. Eisner. Yes. Keegan. Yes. Nevinson. Yes. Infield. Yes. Thank you. And I know Peter's on. So, Peter, thank you. No, th thank you very much. And I appreciate the, the efforts that have been put in place by not only Scott and Carolyn, but uh, by the board for for um, actually getting the help and the um, the operators that we need to, to sustain um, compliance at the facility. You were part of the process too, Peter. So yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything that I can do. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Next item on the agenda is the town administrator's report and town project updates. Carolyn? Sure. So to go for the hiring, I did uh, I did highlight the, the proposal. Um, the human resource director and project coordinator, that, those resumes are due Friday. Um, there are a, we've got about 10 of them. I would say there are a couple that have really risen to the top. So that will be um, come, moving forward. Uh, so I just put in there about the the wastewater proposal that that has been deemed too expensive. Um, so I did want to go down to I had a uh, a student at UMass named Rita Queenie Hackett who reached out to me to share her resume and her need for a looking for um, additional opportunities to do an internship. Um, she's going to UMass to get her uh, master's in public affairs. And she ultimately wants to be an attorney, but she loves municipal government. She has worked for uh, Watertown in several different capacities, whether it was HR, um, legal. She's she's really very familiar. Um, and so she, her and I, 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 we talked last week. Uh, I told her I would share that with the select board tonight. Um, and we're just going to uh, meet again um, and see what... Uh, we are hoping that we might be able to fund a very part-time position, maybe two days a week to pay the intern. So um, it's really difficult now to get an intern that is gonna do it for free. So um, I will keep you updated on that, but it was really nice to have somebody reach out and have some really, really great skills. Mm -hmm. So that's where that is. And let's see, um, still no more replies or input for our government restructure study committee. So we're still looking for that. Our neg our neg negotiations are continuing with the two unions. And uh, let's see, uh, the Russell School Reuse Study, I did put it in um, your documents. Uh, Jake provided um, all of the topics that they're looking at there, and all of the work they've been doing. You'll, you'll see it, it's in there. You can see that what they're they're really focusing on. It's falling within the scope of work, so they're they're definitely looking at each one with equal value. Uh, and um, they, I think, I think the hard part is is when you're doing all that work behind, it looks like they're not doing anything. So I was really happy to get that written um, kind of update of where we're at. So please review that. Uh, it, interestingly, uh, uh, Molly did receive um, some input from, uh, I don't know how, how much you want to go into detail, but I am going to connect the two of them. Yeah, there, there's another organization that kind of out of the blue just reached out um, to ask about, they wanted to discuss possible use of the Russell School. So, so we're going to hope to all meet together, which will be really, that'll okay. be really interesting. Uh, Hockenham, um, our attorney did send an updated agreement of work um, that's needed for completion. She has not heard back from um, the attorney for the company. Uh, so we're just waiting to hear. And really this, everything's the same, 234 Middle Street. There is a tentative closing date scheduled for September 3rd. Lots of emails going back and forth with paper. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. She follows a long email trail back and forth. So a lot of paperwork, a lot of uh, sign-offs were done. So that is it. That's the, uh, the update that I have for you. Okay. Um, I'm just realizing, uh, is that Mike from the... From the collaborative? Yeah, were you here for the discussion yeah. about the health uh, collaborative? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so the good news is, well, the bad news is you missed the discussion, but the good news is we unanimously approved it. Uh, okay. I had seven o'clock on my. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. We actually started the meeting at six. So our Ooh. apologies. You had the wrong time. Well, my apologies to you. And I'm very happy you voted that way. And uh, I, I, I did such a great job. I got a unanimous consent out of you. Thank there you. you. There you go. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You. Well, good night then. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Any questions for Carolyn or if not, then um, any liaison reports or announcements? Not here. No. Nope. Yes, there is. Yeah. 
the um, digital equity surveys. Please fill out the digital equity surveys. They're available here at the Senior Center. They're available online. You can get a link on the town website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In keeping with that, there's a housing survey that needs to be done as well. And that's online. That's in various buildings throughout town. I uh, dropped a bunch of them off at the transfer station last Saturday. So they're available everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they're just because it's survey season, there's also a survey available regarding library use. Um, and okay. ideas for, for that as well. And that's also available. At very, it's going to be one-stop shopping. Pretty much wherever you go, you'll be asked to fill out free surveys. <laughs> and, so. and, they're on the and they're on the website too. Thank you. Um, David? The only thing I have to offer from the school committee is that the people with kids at the elementary school, the uh, supplier for the playground, they're they were waiting on some parts so that's slightly delayed hopefully hopefully that'll all be coming in and by the end of the month and they're talking about a uh, month or so for the playground installer to put up the playground so maybe by the end of september the kids will have something to play on other than a grass field hopefully but uh it's it's underway so. okay that's great thanks for that um and i just have one announcement uh just want to express uh, on behalf of the select board Condolences to the family of Nancy Dickinson, a longtime Hadley resident who recently passed. So um, sending uh, well wishes to her family and close friends. Okay. Um, then if there's nothing else, we do have an executive session uh, scheduled for this evening. I don't know if somebody wants to make a motion that we go into executive session. I move that we go into executive sessions, stating uh, to talk about the compensation study and municipal employees union UPSEU local 424 MADIB 129 and firefighters union IAF local 5486 and contract negotiations with the town administrator and not to return to open session. Second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Um, as chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session. And I state that discussing these matters in open session will have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the town of Hadley. Um, Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Isaac. Yes. Egan. Yes. Devin Smith. Yes. Enfield. Yes. 